Hey everyone, I'm Karen Walby Solomon, and welcome to What's IGN Crushing On, IGN Africa's official entertainment podcast. I'm your host, and I'm joined as always by my producer and editor Rebecca Barchers. So, this is a show where we discuss all things entertainment and pop culture with a new guest every week. We bring recommendations, news, and fun facts sometimes touching on the more serious issues surrounding these topics. The man Glenn Fortune has many sides. Friend, mentor, and icon. Say thank you and my family. Your ASUS is with your little bow. The whole nightclub industry is taking a hit. It's evaporating. And if you look closely at the world that's coming up, we own most of that. Your ASUS is here for Sally. Did you feel backroom casinos operate regularly? It's a multi million rand revenue stream. I can't even bullets for your fight. As you can hear, Louis. This is about paying off debt, and you can stop your operations immediately. But what did you have to do? The guy that you made a promise. Jim Vita Adam said it's a reputation. Let's see who's the type of man, Sally. That's so by your secrets here. Men's career manier on my Twitter blog. That's a man that you have to get to know. That was the trailer of Skimmer Dance. It's currently available to watch on Showmax. Later on in the episode, we have an interview with actor Kevin Smith, who plays the role of Glenn Fortune in the series. But before we get there, we want to chat about our Discord server, Ooh. where you can chat with us and other listeners about various things that we talk about on the show, from movie, TV, book, and music recs. We also share some of our favorite things there, discuss news and more, but we will link to it in the show notes. So please join in. It's, it's a lot of fun. You can chat to other people who are genuinely interested in the same things as you. And like it's, like you can spoil as much as you want, which is the best thing. We also wanted to say thank you to our listeners who Yay. got us charting. Yay. We were, um, last week's episode was the most listened to episode in South Africa in the category TV and film. We are so overwhelmed. It was charting in Nigeria and New Zealand as well. Um, thank you for all your support. Like We are so grateful to you. Yeah. So let's get into this week. This week on the show, we <laughs> chatted to actor Anton Taylor. You know him from Tully's Wedding and Baby Diaries and Josie Shaw's. And he was just such a lovely person to chat to. He was so full of energy. Um, and like everybody knows me, knows that I'm kind of like low energy type human. <laughs> and then his energy really yeah. brought out like, you know what I mean? Like like I even, even I felt more excited at the end of it. Um um, we spoke about Tali and the show, and we spoke about the time he didn't get the lead in the Grease musical at school, which I found hilarious, and when he met Carly Day Jepsen. Rebecca, like, uh-huh. I, I like, I, I think at one point he thought I was just, like, um, like agreeing with him for, like, the sake mm-hmm. of being with him, but, like, uh-huh. I don't think he understands how much I love pop music, so when he yeah. was talking about how much, like, um, how amazing Carly Day James. He thought I was gonna yeah. like be like, no, she's not. But I was like, yes, yeah. of course she is. Yeah, she is. And, he, yeah. and I think for a second he was like, oh, is this girl like? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, she is amazing. That's a gay story. Listen in. Um, listen to what he has to say about it. But yeah, yes, I chat with Anton. Thank you for coming on to the podcast. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me, man. I'm just uh, legitimately stoked to be here. <laughs> I'm excited. So how has this year been for you? Um, the pandemic? Yo. Yo. I think everybody, like, I think everybody's like an insane, insane <laughs> year. I think like... Um, the more you start talking to people, the more you realize, you know, everybody had their own versions of like uh, hardship and, you know, like everybody dealt with a lot of stuff, you know. Um, it seems like a common thing I noticed a lot of people like their friendship 
group changed, you know, people had stresses in different way. Yeah, I mean, it's just sure, it was just a, a it was just a crazy, crazy year. And what was really nice was there were some difficult times. And I remember, you know, I'd lost all my employment and it didn't seem as if there was any, you know, work on the horizon. And I was thinking, sure, you know, what am I gonna like what am I gonna do with my life? And I'm like, I was like I'm not going to be able to work in TV again. I was like, I don't, am I going to have to become like, I do boxing. I'm an amateur boxing, a boxer, but I was like, I don't think I can like, <laughs> good enough to go pro. And then um, at the time as well, it's just like, you know, winter and people in my complex, like people were just being grumpy and just, it was just, it was just like cuck <laughs> and just bleak. And, and then I got this phone call and I was like, Oh, we, like, Tally, so like I mean, Tally's wedding diary came out in 2017, and like I was like I remember at the time being like, you know, oh this is it, like you know, um, finally after years of hacking, I'm like an actor and like I've made it and blah blah blah, and then um, there was just no acting work like ever again. Um, and uh, they basically had said, look, you know, there's not going to be a season two. There was a bit of a deadlock between, I think, I don't know. There were, there were just some reasons why I couldn't go ahead. Um, but luckily I was working as a commentator. So I had something to fill that kind of space. And then COVID came and then um, obviously there was no rugby. Uh, and I also thought like, sure, you know, there, there won't be uh, TV stuff. So yeah, it was like insane. Like, I got we were in Tully's season two, which was like a dream. We filmed that in November, December. Oh wow. Um, just to complete the year, I got we were the only production not shut down because of COVID. We, you know, there was uh I was also like chief COVID cop. But the day, the literally the day after we finished, I got a sore throat and I was like, oh. So I I got to COVID, um, which not to make light of of it, but like for me, I just like lost some weight. Um, I like it. I had a very easy um, experience with it. Um, I wish COVID hadn't happened. Of course, you know it's, it's terrible, but you know in life you do what you can with what you have, and and I do think that I I, I hope that I've come out of it a more I don't know. It's, yeah. Compassionate person. And yeah, I think many people will if they if they use it use the experience positively. Yeah. So I, I've been told to ask you, but um tell us uh, well tell the listeners about what you did to um to entertain your the people in your context <laughs> during, during, uh, during the lockdown. <laughs> so like I really I, I honestly just wanted to like help, you know, and I remember that time when COVID came, one felt real, really powerless. And I think, you know, there were all these people who were just like suffering and, and, you know, there was nothing you could do. You just had to sit in your flat and just, you know, wish for the best, you know, and hope everyone was okay. Um, and if you weren't a medical uh, worker, you sort of, you couldn't do anything. And I think for me, that once again, like shaped my belief that if you make one person's life happier, that matters. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we can't all be doctors saving lives. But if you just, you know, smile at someone and, and say a kind word and that makes them like, you know, before the recording, you gave me a very nice compliment about about something I'd once uh, written and that like that makes me that makes a difference you know that like makes um you know that made me feel really happy so so i think i what we did was you know it started off where i think across like cape town or south africa at 8 p.m they started to do the you know at 8 p.m they would cheer or whatever mm -hmm. and in my complex it, it's uh it's quite nice suited in that it's an amphitheater kind of it's two buildings that look onto each other with a big lawn and so we did it the first day and you know it was quite remarkable because 
in this complex, none of us had ever spoken to each other and sort of we didn't know each other and everyone was grumpy and just, you know, classic Cape Tonians, you know, greet each other. So I knew about like four people here. And then all of a sudden we all just like for a period, like we had this honeymoon period where we became best friends. And I was like, should we just cheer every night? And they were like, yeah. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to do that. <laughs> so <laughs> I would play a song. Um, there would be a credo. We would say, you know, because the focus was always on the cheer for the essential workers, mm. you know, that that was honestly what it was about. And I was just very cautious of it sounding like a, I didn't want it to be like middle class people on their balconies, like giving themselves mm. like a clap on the, you know, on the back. So we would have the applause and then we would play, um, I'd play like a song afterwards. And I said, 8 p.m. every night. Yeah. And it was, it was, um, there were challenges and the, I did it for 200 days, every single day. Sure. And it's because I'd said I would, you know, and, mm. um, you know, it, it was a stressful time. And I, you know, the, what I started to do then was, I started to write stories of essential workers and to share them and to make the cheer dedicated to individual essential workers. Cause I really wanted to make the focus on, on the essential people. Cause I just felt around South Africa, there were all these people who were holding the country together that just weren't being at all appreciated, you know, and like, you know, tellers who were scared, you know, who had to get taxis while everyone else was at home and, so it was challenging because, you know, it's a stressful time and like, you know, one or two people all of a sudden get grumpy because of a noise. And I think it, because of the time of powerlessness, they would like focus on, oh, this noise is now like just five mm. minutes of noise every evening. But I think it made a lot of people happy. Um, you know, there was really some magical things. I mean, we're talking about like, a complex with like, I don't know, like all the lights and everyone at the balcony with waving lights mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, and there were some moments that I'll, I'll cherish, you know, and, and my forever and my brain works in that I tend to forget the kind of unpleasant cuck stuff. And I just focus on the cool things. And what was really nice was I met some amazing people, you know, during the lockdown and, and yeah, so it was a, a crazy cool thing. I mean, playing a song every night <laughs> at 8 p.m. Yeah, even just logistically, like at 7 p.m. you start getting anxious. And I had like a WhatsApp group with like, it was insane, with like all the residents, but I was the only one who could send messages. So it was sort of like a, <laughs> I don't know, like a state controlled, like just one way me sending like a, but um, so I'd write like a, every single day at 7.30, I'd send out a little message uh, with a poem or something like that. And then, yeah, then we'd play the song and um, cheer. So it's just, it's just crazy, but it was, mm. uh, I wouldn't change a thing. Yeah. So, okay. So tell me, okay, let's get back to your career. But yes. um, so was acting always part of the plan for you? Yes, I think so. You know, um, I always loved being creative. I loved using words. So it was acting, writing, and sort of speaking. But I did always want to be an actor. Always wanted to be an actor. And, you know, as a kid, I did. I really wanted to be an actor, which, which makes it so surreal when you're, like, doing this thing that you, that you dreamed of. And like at school, I was in the school plays and, you know, I don't know if my career, I don't know how much it has to do with talent. You know, certainly I've had, um, you know, I'm pretty aware that I've had a, you know, I've, I have a privileged life. So, you know, I've had a lot of assistance, but I'd say that the only thing I would say, you know, I did was just, I was very dogged, you know, and to be an actor, you just have to, all actors, you know, I mean, they, we can be quite unusual people, but often when you see someone there, they've had to undergo a lot of rejection. They've had to hack. And um, mm -hmm. most people I know who, who did it, they just had to carry on trying. So for me, I, 
was in the school plays and I used to get the like, it wasn't quite the tree, but like I'd get the smaller roles and then just carried on and by matric, I was head of drama and I was in the school play Greece. So that was my idea oh, of wow. like, you know, yeah, I'm still absolutely, <laughs> I was head of drama, but I didn't get, I wasn't given the role of Danny Zuko, man. It was like, Who are you? I was Kaniki and I was like, best, come on. I'd like a better character though. No, I know, but I didn't get to be on the poster that was at the bull <laughs> school. I mean, that's what the head of drama said to me. He said, you know, Kaniki's a richer character. Mm. And I was like, I know, but I want to sing Summer Loving. Like, <laughs> come on, man. I got to sing Grease Lightning. And, but I was like, I literally, it was like Grease what, like, was my best. And mm. one day, one day I'm going to go back to singing lessons. I wasn't bad at school. I just haven't sung for 15 years. Um, because I would love to be in musicals. Like, have you watched The Greatest Show, man? No, I haven't. <gasps> Karen, get on. Like, have you watched Glee? Yes. Do you love it by any yeah, chance no, or your heart? Yeah, I know. I do okay. like musicals. I love that stuff. Okay, so anyway, like, Greece was my, pretty much my favorite film. Mm-hmm. And then in grade 11, they're like, the matric play is Greece. And I'm like, oh my word, this is the heavens have the stars have aligned. It's Greece. At that time, I had this thick black hair. I mean, come on. So, and I was head of drama. I was like, yes. And uh, I remember Sandy, she had like come done really well in like pop idols. Anyway, so. I was Kaniki, which I I really liked. My drama teacher was very supportive. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, maybe one day I'll let go of it. But uh, and, and maybe, as you said, was a richer character. Um, and I did get to be in Billboard's Ledge in my life. <laughs> but, but anyway, I, I... Sorry? Where's Danny now? What's Danny doing? Is he on well, Billboard's I've, I don't want to be mean about him. He's, he was, he was a nice, he's a great guy. He's a great guy. He, he got into politics. Oh, okay. Um, and um, yeah, I'm not saying he didn't deserve it. Uh, you know, I, I think I just, <laughs> my gripe was that I had black hair. So it's not much of a, um, much of a leg to stand on. And he had dark brown hair. <laughs> and he was like, he was a foot taller than me. And uh, he was, from the feedback I heard, the best looking guy. <laughs> from the feedback. <laughs> like all the girls after it said how hot he was. So he probably, oh God, the pain still. Ah. Sorry, sorry. So okay. He, anyway, sorry, I'm going on. But basically, I studied drama. I went to Hidden Campus after school. Mm-hmm. And um, it was just a bit different. It was very theatrical based. Um, and I think I have a lot of respect for the guys who do who do that course, but I always wanted to be in film. And I thought, let me do my own thing. And I think the hard thing with being an actor is that you have to put your faith in someone else. You know, like a director has to like you. And if there's any actors out there, really just carry on, just carry on hacking. And nine times out of ten, if you don't get a role. It has absolutely nothing to do with your acting ability. It's because they wanted someone with like a different nose or, you you know, like they had an idea in their head. And what was so lucky for me was that YouTube arrived. So back in the day, if you wanted to be an actor, you'd have to write a script and get it approved Mm. by some, you know, like production company and the, the, you know, the barriers to entry were high. So I started making YouTube videos, but the plan was always to be an actor like um and you know they were fun and the youtube videos look they're hit and miss and some of them did very well and some of them but that's just the creative that you know then the, the, you know putting yourself out there mm. i learned a lot uh, <laughs> i got the thickest there's nothing that i can read about me that will hurt my feelings <laughs> every single um, the comments the comment section of the youtube like my heart is like impenetrable from <laughs> things that people could say and then um you know i was in adverts and i have to say like i i was always like i will not let this dream die 
But when you're 29 and mm. your friends are like, oh, you know, doing, you know, legit stuff and, and, you know, doctors and architects and you're like, hey, share my YouTube video. Like, it's, <laughs> it can sting and people can be mean. So for me, when I got that role in Tully's, I was just like, the first, particularly the first season, it was just like, I can't tell you the relief, you know? And I was like, even mm. if I never had this experience, it wasn't about, I knew it would be successful. And like I said, I thought I'd probably get more work and stuff afterwards. But what it was really about, it was just like, oh, like the hard work paid off. Like, you know, it all, it was all for something. So, so yeah. Um, so, so what attracted you to that project? Like, I mean, look, you know, Ari and Julia who are behind it's, mm. you know, um, Tully is Julia and Ari is her husband who's a director. I mean, obviously they did Suzelle DIY. They are, oh, geez, the creme de la creme of, of production, you know. Mm. Um, and they had seen me in a web series I made and then they'd seen me in a short film that I'd been in. And they said, look, you know, we've, we've got this idea and you know, would you be interested? And we workshopped it and we did like a pilot and yeah, I had a, a connection at Showmax because a web series of mine, they had actually approached me to make it into a, a TV series and I hadn't worked out, you know, like for my career, there's mm -hmm. been, I can't tell you how many near misses or almost, so I was almost that guy there was, you know, so, but I had this connection and what one does is you make a pilot and you sort of, uh, shop it around and um yeah they they contacted showmax and then yeah it just it then turned into showmax's first thing so i think in terms of what attracted me like everything it was just the bit it's 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 the best thing in the world i just i'm just so lucky i'm like sometimes i sit there and i'm like not imposter syndrome but i'm like how the hell did i end up here <laughs> you know like it's it's just so it's such a blessing yeah and i i try sometimes you're tired but i try to always just sit there and be like can you believe what you what you're doing you know you're doing what you love and you get paid it's insane and that like the character of Darren is just like very subdued like i mean obviously knowing your public perso persona before the show like, yeah I'm, I'm saying like for me personally knowing that you were in it and then watching the show and seeing you playing this very subdued character was so interesting. So like, is that sort of like, I, I don't even know what my question is. My question. Yeah. Is, oh. You know, it's interesting because, you know, it, um, it taught me a lot. You know, I think a lot of people who are drawn to act, who acting and stuff, it's because they want to be seen. Mm -hmm. And certainly when I was younger, I wanted to be validated. And you'll find that with a lot of people who get into this industry is it's like they they're looking for that sort of so for me i always used to think i have to be the loudest i have to be the most outrageous and you know i i worked i've spent a lot of time in my life working on therapy and working on myself and i came to realize that you don't have to mm. be the loudest person in the room to you know and also that popularity isn't doesn't actually fill that hole in your sort of uh, you know doesn't give you the validation internally so my previous characters were always quite bombastic very macho guys and in reality i'm 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 not darren like he's I'm more assert, i think much more assertive than him but i'm not the sort of bombastic boot that i was in some of the other things that i did mm. So people would sometimes meet me and they'd expect me to be this kind of, um, this, this put like, come, let's go, you know, let's go beat up some guys. And then, you know, it's, you, you're just like, oh, I'm just, a, sorry, I'm a normal person. And you see them look at you and like <laughs> the experience of them, like seeing who you are as a human being and then being disappointed. <laughs> like, it's like, I see you and I'm so big that you're just a human. And I was like, I'm not, I'm just, I'm just chill. I'm just going to go, you know? So it was actually great because I, if it were not for that uh, series, mm. I would have been typecast. Yeah. Secondly, what, and this is really is credit to the, you know, to, 
to the production team and the writers and was that I really learned that less is more and that, you know, you know, you don't have to be the loudest. You don't have to be the craziest character. And that in me being subdued and sort of grounded, I provide the foil for, yeah. for the other characters. So it was, it was interesting because the first time where I had to actually be, learn to be like, you don't have to steal the scene. In fact, you know, rather let other people do their thing. And that, that, that like it, that it worked, you know, mm. and then the director said, just trust me. And, um, you know, at the end of when I watched the season one, cause you know, you, you, you film it and completely mixed like completely different order. I was like, Oh wow. He was, he was right. You know? Mm. Um, and, um, for me, it was just, I think being subdued or being, how should I say a bit more, I'm I'm almost like the straight character in terms yeah. of like the you know I'm not supposed to be that funny occasionally I am but that was also cool cuz it gave me a lot of acting space you know mm. because I can do stuff and I can be yeah I have a variety of stuff so it was a really helpful um experience yeah it's just like I say like man it's just like I, I sometimes I still am like I, I'm so lucky I don't really know how it happens you know it's just crazy so like in the, the in the baby diary um Dan yeah. goes through quite an interesting character development with like yes gaining self-confidence and his relationship with Liz <sighs> So, like, uh, what did you think of that storyline? And you know, well, I'm just so stoked that you that you recognize that because, like, I absolutely loved it. It mm. was like, you know, I'm so I proud think... of him. I felt like I knew him. I was oh, like, yay! I'm so proud of you, finally. <laughs> you know that um, I won't give away the spoilers, but you know, as the sort of the conclusion, mm. it was like I think my character, people who rooted for me, you know, myself had been waiting for that moment yeah. for for a long time you know and i think what you know once again the credit to the writers was that and i think tv itself has changed and that story arc i mean that's a a story arc that if you think about it is is from it's 18 mm. episodes you know because if you think about darren in season one he's this like meek little you know, kind of very downtrodden dude. Mm -hmm. And then season two, he's in a better space. He's still pandering to Les. And that's why it was like that, that development. I mean, I just, I messaged the, the writers and I was like, just thank you. Like, mm -hmm. I loved it. And, um, you know, that moment where I'm so glad that you saw that, you know, because, um, I don't read people's tweets and I, you know, I don't, I don't sort of, um, and most people will just, they, they enjoy the show, but they won't sort of often give feedback on like something as like you've done, like on the progress of a character, you know? Um, and for me, it was just incredibly vindicating. And I don't know if you remember the moment where I have a sort of a, a confrontation in the final episode. Yes, um, of course. I, like that for me I read that and I was like oh my word and in my you know I mean you're acting you obviously have to take yourself into that space mm. and it, the quite a cool story is that like I was like I want to look into camera and and like it's a very quick look and the camera crew just got it but in my mind you know it was me saying to Brad, to like everybody that's that's ever doubted me like <laughs> i told you i can I swear like I, well, I bloody told you so i think obviously darren's going like ha you see like you know like i, I did it and although i'm not particularly driven by like proving the haters wrong or whatever it was a very like ha you know <laughs> so it is the most rewarding 100 percent the most rewarding and vindicating acting experience of my life yeah I was and thinking, I'm so like, glad yeah I love like the little things so, like the fact that Darren is so nice that he would listen to the guy that's selling property like I just yes. oh, I love, and like he's and he's rewarded for that fact yeah just listening to this guy ramble on like you know oh, yeah I <laughs> well I I love someone 
who is discerning and, and who notice those things. So I think, you know, and I'm like, I'm not upset about it, like, but some of those aspects that you pointed out, like I put a lot of effort into those small things and mm. it's like the little look and the sort of, uh, it's the less is more, you know? Um, and so like when someone notices that it's like, Oh, you know, that's, um, very, very gratifying, you know, cause it's like the small things and that little bit of extra work, you know, but once again, the writers and, uh, are either director, I mean, sure. They're just, they knocked it out the park. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so what is it like yeah. working with Julia? Like you guys she, have you know, good chemistry. She's just a consummate professional, you mm. know, um, her and Ari, her husband are like an amazing team. They've just, it's just this crazy combination of talent. Um, mm. But, you know, what I always think, you know, so I watched, I don't know if you watched The Last Dance um, about Michael Jordan. So I'm quite interested in these sort of documentaries mm. on these very driven and successful sportsmen. But the, the one thing that Michael Jordan, so he was like the best of all time. And um, he says, you know, he never asked anybody to do anything that he didn't do which is mm -hmm. what I try to prescribe, you know, in terms of my life. And, you know, we worked hard on that, on that second season, you know, it was five weeks, six days a week, um, 12 hour days, you know, I was doing on Sundays, I was working for SA rugby, you know, it was stressful. There was a time of COVID. We were all so scared about COVID and, um, you know, you just start to get exhausted because mm -hmm. you, you know, your call time is at like, say, 6 a.m. and or 7 a.m. And then you're going to get home at like 9 and you're going to, you know, you have life and stuff. So you, you're you not going to get eight hours sleep. And after yeah. five weeks of that, like, you know, you start to. But Ari and Julia, they were just, they worked so hard. And, um, mm. you know, they're both, they're both, yeah, geniuses. And, um you know, I think what's also insane is that I just did the acting and that was in itself quite a, like, like I loved it, but it was, mm. yo, it was, it took a pound of flesh. Um, they edited, like the turnaround time on that, what they did is like, un like it's unprecedented in terms of, they were doing two episodes a week. So we wrapped on the 12th of December and they handed over something like two months later and you know, there was so like, it, I can't, you know, overemphasize like the, the ambition, but the success of what they pulled off. So working with them and working with Julia, you know, we, we learned a lot. That was very mm -hmm. professional. And, um, you know, I was, I didn't have a, uh, university training in acting. And what I learned from all the cast was a lot about acting, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, I think Julia and I, we really just were like, let's do the best, you know, let's make this the best we can. Yeah. So it was, it was a, I got a lot from it. Yeah. I learned a lot and it, it was, I mean, yeah, I really think my acting it was, yeah, very, very helpful. Yeah. So, um, so the other like great romance of the show is between dad and then rail. Yes. So <laughs> What is um so what is your relationship like with Glenn? I would so so Glenn, so so Julia and I, I mean we like you know, we 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 like you know it's it's very professional. Mm -hmm. I mean obviously we all get on with each other, but Rail and I, Glenn, he was at school with me, okay. Oh, so okay. I know this oak from back in the day. And I mean, you know, I was talking about my drama days. <laughs> I still remember I was I was head of drama in matric he's two years younger than me <laughs> and he he was going around saying he was head of the draw he was head of drama or something so i was a matric and i was a uh, head of a house i called him into my office and i said you know you, you will not be saying this um i mean and we've always we've known each other over the years and we have a really really great rapport you know in season one he, uh, you know, some actors are competitive. Um, mm. I, I didn't experience that on, on tallies, but, you know, sometimes you'll be where we guys, particularly like say male roles, they don't want the other guy to, 
Whereas Glenn sat down with me and spent an enormous amount of time like teaching me to act, you know, because I went in there as a, as a YouTuber, you know, and we just had so much fun. And I, I still want to say I irritate Glenn, but not irritate him, but I'll just kind of like kind of go up to him and just sort of like say something ridiculous and then leave or like, you know, go and <laughs> just bother him. But, oh, it's so fun. And then, you know, we have this like running joke because he sometimes he won't reply to my messages and I'll, I'll like, you know, just say like he's forgotten about me now that he's more famous. And um, at season one of Tully's, I had more Instagram followers. And then I used to like, as he just like, he's nuked me. Like he's just pumped. He's, he's so much more famous than me. <laughs> so he's... um Oh man, it's just so fun working with him. And what's also what's great is that our rapport is natural. And I think what I noticed in season two is that all the actors, we had a season already to, to understand each other. You know, the season one, it was like, boom, first day, act, go, work each other out, work out the relationship between the director you know, we're season two, it was just like we knew each other and Glenn and me, I mean, it's just, it's, um, yeah, I, I always use like sports references, but I don't know how many people like follow rugby. Um, and I, <laughs> I always say it's like um, the, the fly half center, Pollard and um, Dear Lendy, the, the combination of for the South African back line and that we just sort of, we work naturally together, you know, so, um, oh, it's, he's a vibe. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what's next for you? So I have been there. I, I believe there might be a, well, I'm hoping that there will be a, a third season. Oh, yes. You know, I, I'm, I'm intent on hacking on. I would really like to, to pursue acting as far as I, as I can, you know, and I think South African TV at the moment is in the best space it's ever been. You mm-hmm. know, I think about, you know, the oct- my octopus teacher was just nominated for an Oscar for editing. I know the guys behind that, um, the South African documentary tracing the sun, um, I think was the best production that's ever uh, mm-hmm. come out of the country just in terms of, you know, it's obviously it's, it's sporting, but I mean, it was mm-hmm. authentic. I think it was really groundbreaking because I think South African viewers more and more, they want authentic content. Um, you know, so I think that there's a, it's a really good uh, time for South African TV. Mm. And I, yeah, I just, I, I'm going to work and hack and, you know, you, you don't know. And in time to come, you know, obviously I enjoy being creative in the past. I've done web series and stuff like that. So, you know, there's always, and I did a master's in creative writing. So there's, there's always that option of maybe coming up with my own stuff. Um, but at the moment it's, it's been like a dream come true. Um, I also work as a rugby commentator for super sport. And what I love about that, it's a bit similar to acting and writing and that I love rugby, but I love words. Mm. And so I get on there and, you know, Supersport is a fantastic, a fantastic company to work for. Like everyone is just so cool. And I just love sitting there and being creative. So I try to find new ways to describe a try or I try to bring in like a, a cultural reference to sort of, you know, whatever, like a, you know, contemporary South African pop. And, um, so at the moment, I'm working quite busily for them, um, which is also wonderful because I I thought that was done. And now all of a sudden, it's sort of, it's back and I'm busy and I'm flying up to Pretoria every couple of days. And that's very rewarding for me. And I've also been um, do working with South African rugby where we're doing comedic, sort of a, a comedic rugby wrapper. And that's quite cool because... I think it's shifting sports is kind of in South Africa, often very one dimensional. Mm. And I'm, I'm a big believer that people believe they're interested in human stories. So whether it's my commentary, it's like, I'm not going to talk that much about the stats, but I'll talk about, you know, the person's life story. So this thing with SA rugby, it's like, we don't really talk about rugby. We just like, 
have like memes and like, <laughs> like, like clips from <laughs> popular culture. So, so yeah, it's, I'm just going to carry on trying and going. And my aim, my main, my main aim for 2021 is actually just to get more sleep. <laughs> so yeah, but I hope that my main thing is it's nice. I hope I want to make people that have supported me proud because mm -hmm. You know, I've had a lot of help and a lot of people took chances on me and, and gave me opportunities when they didn't have to or saw stuff in me when I didn't. So, yeah, my main, like, my biggest driver is to to make those people, to reward them, to say thanks, you know, for believing me. And I always think, like I said to you right at the beginning, if a show that you're in makes one person laugh, if it makes mm -hmm. one person happy, then that's that's worth it, yeah. Okay, so our final question that we ask everybody is, um, was your first celebrity crush? Oh, I mean, I've got a lot of celebrity crushes. <laughs> and I like, I go deep there. Eh? I'm not like about their music. I'm about their life story. I mean, I'm not even going to get onto Justin Bieber because <laughs> I am a believer, okay? And it's, it's not because I'm happy that like, you know, recently he's been putting out bangers, mm. but it's his life story. You know, my first, sure. Oh, okay. My first, definitely Spice Girls. All of talk them. about. So, no, not all of them, but I think it's quite an integral, like, you know, it's probably one of life's big questions. Who mm. was your, your favorite? When I was a kid, for a stage, it was, it was sporty, but then it changed to scary. And it's, it's stage, so it stayed with scary. But then my, I didn't like <laughs> research their life stories. I was just like a kid who was in love with them. Mm -hmm. um, but a real celebrity crush was Carly Rae Jepsen. You know, the, yeah. um, and this, I, it's crazy. So her song, Call Me Maybe, was like, mm -hmm. it's like my favorite song of all time. I mean, we can objectively. Brilliant. No, it's it, oh, well, All her music oh, is brilliant. Uh, Yes, and a woman of fine taste. Latest albums that everybody just keeps ignoring and it's just hit off the Yes, <laughs> yes, you are, oh, you are on the money. And so, oh my, I just, you have the best taste. You've just, can, like, can you just please make sure this stays in, that you like literally everything that I love, you notice. And like that the rest of the world don't, doesn't notice, like, why are people not celebrating Connor A. Jepsen? Like, you know, in the just you're great. So anyway, so Kylie, obviously, objectively the greatest song. So I started like following her, but what I really respected about her was that there's two things. Like her music makes people happy. Mm. Like it, it it's like, you know, like you you feel good. Mm. And she, she got success quite late in her life, you know, and she had to hack quite a lot to get to where she, she did. And, you know, she did Call Me Maybe, and then everyone wrote her off like One Hit Wonder. Yeah. And then she came back with um, I Really, Really Like You. So anyway, she came to South Africa in 2015, and it was like common knowledge that I was her biggest fan in the country. And I got to, like, interview her i said to the, the the company i was like i will do whatever you want to promo it mm. and i got to meet her and the best thing was she was so cool and mm. it is the nicest when you meet we all have heroes on different levels and you know it, it's 50 50 it's like sometimes you meet your heroes and you're devastated but sometimes you meet your heroes and you are just elevated and I met her and she must have thought I was a bit crazy because she's used to like press conferences where they're like, Carly, like, can you tell me like, so what's your next pop? And I was like, Carly Rae Jepsen, you, 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 you make, you remind me that light outshines the dark. <laughs> and I want to live in a world where people like you do well and with, you know, people who make other people happy are rewarded, which is true. And she was so cool about it. I mean, I, I don't know if she thought I was insane. And I gave her a Springbok jersey. It was during the 2015 World Cup. And she came on stage in the jersey and she said, um, I met someone really what? cool. And Yeah, it was the best thing oh, ever. What? 
I thought she might DM me after and we'd be best friends, but um, that we didn't go that far. But um, yeah, so that was my first like like proper. Oh, no. And my dream is my dreams one day if I'm famous, I will invite her to like you know perform at the <laughs> premiere of my movie. <laughs> I believe it. I believe it can happen. Yeah, I shot a lot of strange things in my life. You know, when I think about being a pimply 13-year-old kid, you know, I don't think I would have mm. thought that I would be in a TV show. So, you know, I, I, life's taught me that, you know, anything can happen. Thank you so much, Anton. This was lovely. Karen, this was fantastic. Thank you for... And I talk so much. I'm so sorry to your editor who will try to chop this up. Thanks to the listeners for uh, putting up with the stream of consciousness waffling. This is how I am. I don't know what's going to happen when I like am interviewed by like scary press people who like manipulate your words. But this is I just love this. And thank you for giving like for talking to me. It was a really rewarding. Yeah, it was great. That was our chat with Anton. You can find him at I am Anton Taylor on Instagram. Kali's Baby Diary is available to watch on Showmax. I don't know why I ended that with like a question mark. Okay. <laughs> it's available to watch on Showmax. <laughs> okay. So we also chatted to Kevin Smith. Kevin is a legendary South African actor who's been on everything, like literally everything. Um, from Igoli to Isidingo, if you guys know I'm an Isidingo stan, to Arden's Flay. And he plays the role of Glenn Fortune, the patriarch of the Fortune family and the owner of the jazz club, The Oasis, in Skimmer Dance. Skimmer Dance is a 13-part drama series on Showmax created by our former guest, Amy Jeffter, who's in episode two of season two, and Ephraim Gordon. Um, Rebecca, like, I don't, <laughs> I, I think I kind of freaked Kevin Smith out because I was so excited to talk to him. Because yeah, as, uh, understandably so. Of Isidingo and a big fan of Frank Xavier and Frank and Lolly were my were my Isidingo ship. So yeah. um, so he was like, okay, girl, you know, I'm just I'm just normal, and I'm just like almost in tears out here. But I played a really <laughs> cool in the interview, and I think I did a good job. But <laughs> but yeah, nice. Here's our chat with Kevin. So how are you? How has this um, quarantine um, COVID experience been for you? I think it has been quite an eye-opener to have been part of something that we know is happening worldwide. Mm. So that this is not just an individual or a few people that are being affected by this, but this is something that is happening on a worldwide level. And watching how people have responded to it, I find it quite inspiring. Uh, for me, it has been a time to reflect, a time to look at myself, a time to ask questions of myself, a time to really engage with the things that are important to me. I think that pre-quarantine, people get lost in so many different things. Your focus gets taken all over the place, but quarantine really made you focus. It made you decide, look, what am I going to do with my time? Uh, it's not just time wasted, but time really focused on specifics. So it has been for me a time physically. I've had to just keep myself sane. I've had to train much harder than I would have if it wasn't quarantine. It's again, those things are the things you take for granted. Quarantine took all of that away from us. Mm -hmm. So we had to really get a taste for, for living with ourselves. So that was my experience of quarantine. It was a time to really reflect and, and, and get to know who, who I am and what are the things that are important to me. So, okay, so tell, tell the listeners a bit like what Skirmer Dance is about. Skirmer Dance is about family. And I think that is the thing that we, we all relate to. Mm. And it's about family and it's about power struggles within the family. I think that it really unpacks what happens when family is put under pressure, when there's a crisis in the family and how do those different family members respond to that crisis. And again, it's, what is interesting for me is it, it shows people who have inherent weaknesses and those weaknesses are exposed mm. through the crisis that happens in the family. 
So what was filming like? Did you guys film under lockdown? We did. We filmed under lockdown. So all the protocols were in place mm. very strictly. And, you know, as much as it's an irritation, it is something that the last thing anybody wants to do is to mm. have your shows shut down because you find that the coronavirus is somewhere in that. So I think it's important that we keep the measures very strict. And we were, I mean, we had twice a day, someone would come and check our temperatures. You had to sign in in the morning, you get a temperature check. There was a guy who would walk around with a spray and sanitize all the time. I've never been so clean in my life. <laughs> so, 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 I, so, I think we were very good. I think that the production did very well as far as sticking to, to the regulations. And I think it makes a difference because it makes you feel, okay, these guys are taking care of what needs to be taken care of, and I can focus on what I need to do. So, yeah, so, so you, t- you asked me a little bit about, about the experience of, 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 of filming mm. on Schema Dance. Yes, as much as under quarantine conditions, it was quite challenging. But as an experience, I, I think I was working with some really great actors. Mm. I think Ephraim is a wonderful director. I think Amy as a, as a, as a producer and as a co-director, I think they have two beautiful eyes and ways of seeing and that was reflective in the process of being on set. So I think there was a very good energy on set because they set that up. Mm. I think it was important for them to create people feeling, you know, we are doing something which is exceptional and we're going to do a brilliant job of it. So tell us about your character, the character that you play. He, he's a dreamer. You know, on so many levels, he, he came from the poor side of the world. And I think that people who understand poverty have a greater appreciation for success mm. because they are driven. And he's driven. He's driven to make a success of it. He starts, I mean, he's, he's beginning monologue. He talks about growing up in the streets, playing in the streets. And that was like all he had. And then going and, and having a dream of saying, I can make something of myself. Mm. And that's what he does. He makes something of himself. And he is, he's the patriarch. Mm. So he really holds that masculine energy of the patriarchal figure within the family. And because he is so driven and so focused, I think he, he, he doesn't really have the sensitivity to uh, understand how his behavior affects the rest because he is so driven and so kind of one track mind but i think he look i think he really loves his daughter i think that relationship is a very strong and key relationship unfortunately we don't we don't really explore it as much as 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 i think it would have been great to have to Mm. have understood more about the character we don't really explore it but he has very clear relationships he's relationship with his mother is a very key relationship so as much as he's a patriarchal figure his connection within the matriarchy is a very important one. Does that, does that, does yeah. that answer your question? Yes, that answers my question. Um, so what attracted you to this role? Like, why, why, why this one? The first thing that you do when you read a script, it's, it's, it's about what are the textures? You know, a script is something that's quite flat. It doesn't live until it comes off the page. But... Sometimes you can read a script that sparks your imagination. This script is what sparked my imagination. So when I read episode one, I thought this is so, it's so complex. There's so much that has been set up in that first episode mm-hmm. that it titillated me. It, it inspired me. It sparked something inside of me. And that made me say, this is a story that needs to be told. So. Mm-hmm. It always comes from that script. And then, of course, there's those other elements that then come into play when you look at who are the people that I'm going to be working with. Both Ephraim and Amy, I have a huge amount of respect for. I think they're a force in, in, in South African film and television. I think they're a strong force. And then working with the caliber of actors that I've got to work with, that is also another key. So when those elements fall into place, how do you say no? <laughs> So tell me, like, how do you, how did you find this role different from what you played before? You know, I've, 
I'm heading towards my 60s. I always, as a younger actor, got kind of cast as the romantic leads, mm. uh, the kind of, you know, smooth, suave, kind of romantic character. As I'm getting older, I find the characters that are being offered to me have a little bit more bite to them. Mm. They have a little bit more gravity to them. They have a little bit more weight to them. They've got a little bit more edge to them. And that's what's exciting to me. So I approach this character in that way of saying, this is an edgy man. Mm. This is a man who's always lived on the edge of his life. He has always pushed the boundaries. And for me personally, I find it's a time in my life that that's what I have to do. One never knows how much time you have left on this earth in this time. So it's important to grasp everything that you have, to seize every moment that you can and to make the most of it. So that, you know, that, that, that's, mm -hmm. if I were to say, what is, you asked me the question, what is different to the roles that I've played? I think it has to do with the immediacy of making, making every moment count. So why do you think that people should watch Scammer Dance? Because there's some really damn fine actors in it. <laughs> I mean, we've got a we've got a we've got a we've got a cast that I think mm. it, it's appetizing. These these are these are people who have been in the industry for a, a long time, and they new young talents that are coming in that are just as exciting. And I think we're showcasing. I mean, it's always difficult for me. I find, and I have to say this, Karen. I find this. It's a sad thing that we live in a country that has become so segregated that we see things in terms of black and white and colored and, you know, we've become so accustomed to looking at the world in such small little pieces. But I think it is important to tell stories that are colored stories. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the whole idea of, of apartheid is, uh, for me, the most horrible thing that ever happened to this country, and we need to break that down. But I also think it is important to tell stories from a very specific perspective. And this is a very colored perspective. And I think that's important. I don't even, I don't even like the word colored. I mean, I find it just, it's just so ridiculous because that was something that someone dreamt up and put it down on a form. And then now we're all still following along that road. We, I, I still believe we've got to break that down. But we have to tell stories from people that live in a particular uh, grouping, mm. right? Yeah. So that's what we're talking about. And we're looking at those people, people of mixed race who came from a particular culture and how we developed in a greater South Africa that has got so many other things that are going on. Mm. So that is the story we're telling. And I think it's important for people to watch it from that perspective, to get an understanding of how the people mm. that we are talking about lived, breathed and succeeded so i think that's that's for me a key thing of why i think people need to watch i think um on that point a lot of people in the industry have said that they've seen a change in that now that they are you know people are telling their own stories so have you been found like have you found like more an authenticity in like in like the in the writing that you've been getting in the work you've been getting because you know, having colored people tell, writing for colored people is a little bit different than having a white person write for a colored person, for example. Um, have you been finding that? Most definitely. I think that we, I think that, uh, I do think that there are people and writers and artists and, and, and entertainers who have the ability to understand intrinsically what people are going through. I think that's what we do. But to get writers, to get a voice from somebody who's grown up in that, who has eaten the food, who has the taste, who has the smells, and that is what makes something authentic. It's not just saying I can tell a story because I've observed it and I know what it looks like, but it's to have lived it. And that is what the voices are that are coming out now and the opportunities that are being given to writers to say, this was my own personal experience. And then when you give it to an actor who's also had that experience, it just adds a level and a layer to that. As a viewer watching it, you know this is authentic. I remember, like, obviously, um, when, you, when you were younger, you were in a lot more roles where you were, like, racially ambiguous, like... You weren't, you weren't like 
cast as like a colored character or something like that. Has that changed a lot as you got an old? I think I will. I think I think I will. I think it will always be ambiguous. I think mm. that's. I think that's what's interesting. And I think when you try to peg somebody to one thing, you're making a mistake. Mm. Because for me, one has a stereotypical idea of what colored mean, mm. and I would like to break that completely. I would like to say, don't don't think you know who we are. Mm. Don't think you know what we are. Don't think you know how we speak or how we react or what we've read or what our intellectual experience is because it's far greater than what you could ever imagine. Mm. So don't try to pigeonhole me. I never want to be pigeonholed. I always want to break whatever mold I can in, in whichever way that I can. Even, even when we're talking about sexuality, I think, I think we need to break down the stereotypical ideas of what is a man and what is a woman. I think we need to look at it as I say, and this is what our show does, Kimber Dance does. It has very strong matriarchal energy, a very strong patriarchal energy. But we're also seeing new energy coming, and that is saying we need to change the roles mm. or not what you thought they were. So okay, yeah, maybe we should talk about how was the cast? Like how did you enjoy working with I mean, the oh. people that you've worked with before and Yeah, Ilza and Ilza and I we've we've been uh, Man and Frau in a couple of things we played. <laughs> Husband and wife in a couple of plays. So we have a very um, a very comfortable mm. connection with each other. I think we're comfortable being close. Um, and Ilza might tell you something completely different, but <laughs> I find her I find I find her she goes into things with full heart, with full commitment, and for me to then have to work with that means that I've got to bring my game up. Mm. It doesn't allow you to get away with anything. You know, if you're on set with Ilza, then you've got to bring your game. You've got to bring your A game. There's nothing else. And then uh, Vinette also, who plays my mother, is also, you know, she's a strong, strong figure. You know, mm. and she comes with all of that and all of that experience. So, you know, spending time with those strong women is, Sure, it's exciting. It's a beautiful thing for me to, 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 to share space with them, to share a screen with them. I can't believe Annette is playing like grandmother roles now. <laughs> I can't. I'm going to be playing grandfather roles, you know. <laughs> it happens once that age, you know. But I think, again, that's, that's the beauty of, of the work that we do, is that you bring your experience your life experience to every role that you play so you know i think vinette is she can be the, the beautiful femme fatale or she can be the strong matriarchal, matriarchal grandmother figure that holds the whole family by the tight reins you know so that is the versatility of of the actors that we're dealing with who have uh a lifetime of experience and can play anything between you know 40 to 60 70 but again Karen I mean I think we need to also understand age is no not what it was 20 years mm -hmm. ago so what you consider to be an old person when they get to be 50 60 that means that an old person that's not the truth mm -hmm. I think I can do anything that a 30 year old or a 20 year old can do in fact At this moment in time, I'm working on a show where I play an assassin. It's an action. It's an action role. It's um, it requires me to be physically very on top form, you know. And it's not what you would say. This is a 60 year old. It's not that at all, you know. So, I think anything is possible. I don't think one is limited by age, by race, or by anything. One should never be limited. Those are limitations that other people might put on you, but it's up to you to change that. So, okay. So tell me more about you. Was it like always your plan to be an actor? It's funny. I was thinking, I was talking to a friend of mine. I'm working on a play at the moment. I, uh, I love the theater. Mm. And when I started off as an actor, it, as, a, as a young person, thinking about what is it that I love? Where's my passion lie? I always imagined myself that I would be part of a, a company of actors that did interesting work. There was a time in South Africa where we had 
we would travel. You would go to small towns, you would put on performances, you would go to the schools, you would put on performances. I remember being at school when, when there was a school theater program that came to the school and I, I watched that. Those were the things that captivated me and interested me in saying, how do we, how do we use the idea of, of theater to tell stories to people that can then make people think about things in a different way? So my dream, which I'd still like to hopefully follow, is to, to be able to take theater to people, to take live theater to people, to perform to people. Mm-hmm. COVID has told us, Mm, it's a risky thing to do because we can't put a lot of people into a small space. So, so that's where live theatre has really struggled. But I'm hoping that it makes a comeback. Mm. And they can be creative about it, I suppose. Exactly, mm. exactly. Um, so, of course, most people know you as like Frank Xavier in Isidingo. But what was your favourite role that, you, that you've played? It's... Unfortunately, it was a very obscure part, and I don't think many people got to see it, which I think is a great pity. But it was a film that was made by uh, director Daryl Root, who is, you know, is doing quite a bit of work. And this, it, it came from a short story that was written by Ahmad Tagore, who passed just recently. Uh, it was a story that was called Job Man. And we made a film of that. Uh, And I think it was a role of a deaf, mute man who came from a colored environment and was ostracized, pushed out of his community because he he couldn't speak, he couldn't hear, and he was really just isolated. And it's a love story because he falls in love with one of the women she falls in love they have a child in the community and he takes his child and his woman and he goes to make a life for his own but he is hunted down by his own people and he's also hunted down because the other parallel story is is that he grows up with a white boy and they have a very strong relationship which this white brother of his is the one that hunts him down and eventually kills him. So I've got to tell you, this is the other thing that seems to happen to me. I seem to die a lot in movies. <laughs> I don't know what I don't know what that's about. But you know, I always end up getting killed, so I don't know what that's about. I wonder you say that, that, that my favorite is um is will always be Mielanders. <laughs> yeah. Do you get that one no, a lot? Mulanders is beautiful. <laughs> I, I, I love Mulanders. I love Mulanders because, again, we were sitting in an unusual environment, and I, I had an opportunity to play on uh, to be to live on an island. We went to live on an island in the middle of the ocean. We spent, I think, we had ten days that we oh. were completely away from the rest of the world. Everything that we had, the water, the food, was brought in because. Saldana was across the road from the island, but it was Malchas Island, and it has the biggest bird colony is on this island of various different bird species, but particularly the gannet. So it was an experience to live in a world that very few people have an opportunity mm. to experience. And that has been the most wonderful thing for me being an actor, that I've been given an opportunity to do things that most people don't get the chance to do. But Mulanders was beautiful. And, and I have to just bring, because it's quite important for me, Mulanders was directed by a very, very dear friend of mine, uh, Gerrit Schoenwiffen, who uh, passed in October of, of last year at 62 years of age, which again just brought me back into the thing of life is short. You don't know when it's going to end. Mm. Make the most of the time that you have and really maximize and utilize everything that you can to make the most of the time that you have, because you don't know where it can end. Sure. So, um, so who have you, who haven't you worked with yet that you'd still love to? Oh, yeah, this, that, that is, a, that is a tough question because I'm just seeing so much young talent that's mm-hmm. out there that I think, no, oh, I'd love to, I'd love to work with them. I can't, I can't, I can't say, I, I think I've, 
of my peers. I think I've worked with everybody, but I think there's a lot of young talent that's coming up that I would really love to work with. And I'm watching on, on TV and I'm thinking, these guys are great. Uh, I think Arden's play also exposed me to a lot of young talent. Mm. So, yeah, you know, I, I can't pinpoint one, but there's so much young talent out there that I think I would love to have the opportunity to just spend time with them and make something exciting. I just finished working on something now with Monique Rockman and with Irshad Ali, who are uh, in South Wester. It is a silver scarum fierce uh, part of that, that that is going to be in the competition. I worked with a fantastic writer-director. His name is Jerome Uffermeyer. And again, I just, I'm struck by the wealth of talent that we had. These are young actors that I was working with and they are just fantastic. So I'm hoping for more opportunities like that. I think this, this is a very important opportunity for people is making short films. I think the short film as a medium is giving writers, directors and crew an opportunity to do interesting work that pushes the boundaries because you don't have to necessarily be commercial and kind of fit into a commercial form, but it allows you to play. So the short form is fantastic. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of more of that happening and exposing young writers, young talent, young actors, directors to a medium where they can tell their story in an interesting way. Mm. So the question that you asked me, who would I like to work with? Um, anyone in this industry is fantastic. <laughs> 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 you, you said that um, you know you've been seeing a lot of things on TV. So what kind of so what have you watched recently that that you could recommend or that you've enjoyed? Well, I think I, I, I think that taking it, I think the Afrikaans industry is really interesting. I'm, I'm looking I'm looking at we did we did Spruce. I think Spruce was a very interesting storytelling. Uh, again, Monique was in that. And, and looking at the idea of the supernatural, mm -hmm. I thought that was a very interesting uh, series. I think I like the legal aspect of, of Feinscript. I think Feinscript is also a very interesting uh, show that is on there. And I, I find a lot, of, a lot of the short forms that I've been watching, what they, they, all the Silver Scarum stuff that mm. has been going out, I've, I've been quite taken by what people are doing and how experimental uh, filmmakers are being. And I think with platforms like, like Showmax, it is also allowing, it's allowing new writers to come to the fore and giving people an opportunity to, to, to tell the stories. So as much as I can pinpoint specific things, I think it's important for us to be critical and to watch whatever is coming out and to be critical of, of the work that we're seeing in order to improve the industry that we're in. Mm. And I think that that has changed a lot now that there's more content coming out, is that we don't have to be okay with everything. We can say, okay, this is where this one can do better. This is how this one has done well. And it is great. It's, 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 it's amazing that there is so much for us to watch now. Correct. I mean, there's also a lot of stuff that, you know, you, give it five minutes, give it 10 minutes mm. and move on to something else. So you have to be, it again means that you have to put something on the screen that is excellent. Mm. It means that you can't be lazy and just think, you know, I can do whatever I want because there's just so much content. Everybody wants content. The competition is still very fierce. Mm. So what's next for you? So, so what I'm working on now is a, is a telenovela uh, and it's for BET. Um, and it's a show that's called Isono, which is again very interesting because it goes into the African continent. Uh, it's being broadcast. Uh, you know, I think you know BET. Yeah. It, it, it is African content. So, and, and this is where I play a role of an assassin. And it's you know, it's actors dream to play an action hero. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's what's going on. You know, I get to yeah, I get to play with guns, I get to be mean, I get to be like rough people up, I get to do all of those kinds of things. Um, which again, at, at my point in life, to be given that opportunity is just fantastic. Mm. And then theatre again. So I, I'm back, I'm back in the theatre. 
I'm doing a show that opens in a week's time. It's my first love. Theatre will always be my first love. It's something that I really could spend the rest of my life being involved with. And we are taking, we're taking short stories and we're making visual. We're making a short story visual. And again, it gives you it gives you the room to play with something because it's not a specific text. So it's about how do you physically represent something. And being on stage, you've got to use your body. You've got to be fit. You've got to be strong. You've got to be sharp. You've got to be creative. And unlike with a film or a television where you can cut and you can close up and you can do all kinds of trickery, when you're on the stage, mm. you're exposed you out there, you've got to be brilliant because there's nowhere to hide. So there's that that's happening. And then looking into the future, I'm hoping that I can, I can realize that dream of getting, getting a company of actors together who can take live theater to work into, into South Africa and perform for people that don't get the opportunity to mm-hmm. see live theater. I think that could really be something. I would love to be able to to make a, a reality. Oh, I almost forgot to ask. Um, so, do you have any um, Club Galaxy memories? <laughs> I do actually. I, I mean, I, you know, I, I I could get out there and do you know my John Travolta <laughs> number. I remember bell bottoms. You know, I loved the bell bottom and I loved the three piece suit. I thought it was fantastic. And that was me, you know, when I, Galaxy for me was 80s. When mm. 80s was staying alive, 80s was all about disco, you know, so Galaxy was hot. Um, I don't have specific memories. I just, you know, I know myself. I used to wear platform shoes, bell bottoms, three piece suit. I was eight I can tell you. I, I, I love dressing up. I love looking good. I love being out there and, you know, feeling I'm, I'm in charge of my world. So, you know, if I have memories of, of, of the galaxy, it's that. It's being, being in a, a beautiful world that was, in a way, so much more innocent than it is now. You know, I think the kind of things that we got up to in the 80s, we wouldn't do it now. <laughs> Too many crazies out there. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Um, so this is the question we ask everybody, but um, who's your first celebrity crush? Celebrity crushes? Yo, I can't even, I can't <laughs> even think who. I, I, I can't come up with anybody. I can't come up with anybody. I just, I just remember as a, as a young actor, the people that I really admired when I saw them and had the opportunity to work with them. You know, Marius Weyers and Sandra Plinslu mm. and, and, and Charlene City Richards, uh, as a young actor, getting the opportunity to work with them. Those are people that I idolized, you know, mm. and I, if I were to say w- what my role models were, those were people that I saw on stage. Those were the people that I would love to have thought, you know, what the, I find the way that they represent themselves as actors. I would like to model myself on those mm. kinds of actors. And you did end up... And, and I did. I got the opportunity yeah. to work with... I got the opportunity to spend time with Charlene, with Marius, and with Sandra. All of those people I got the opportunity to spend with. So, so you know, I, I was able to realize my, my idols to be able to mm. spend time with them. Okay, Kevin. Thank you so much. This was lovely. Sure. Uh, thank thank you, for, you. Yeah, thank you for agreeing to do this. I mean, this is, this is, this is wild for me. Anyway, to talk to you. But <laughs> it's been such a pleasure for me to speak to you. And again, you, you know, you took me for a walk down memory lane. <laughs> and I think that that Schema Dance as a, as a production, I, have, I, I haven't seen it. I think you've, you've watched the first episode. I haven't had the opportunity to, opportunity to see it. But I know in my heart that it is a piece of exceptional work that is coming out of a, a country and out of a culture that we need to hear a lot more from. Mm. As I say, you know, I, I hate the idea of the segregation that we've we've lived had to live under that we're still struggling to 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 understand. But I think we've got some really unique voices that come from that particular uh, sphere, from that particular culture, and we're getting to learn a little bit more about about those people. And I think it's about time because I think that those stories can travel across the world. 
I don't think it, we are limited to only a South African audience. I think that we can appeal to an audience across the world and people will be extremely taken by the stories that we have to tell from, from a South African perspective. Thank you so much. That was our interview with Kevin Smith. Skimmer Dance is now available to watch on Showmax. And now it's time for our favorite segment of the show, Rebecca. What have you been crushing on? Hello. Um, I've actually been crushing on um, Showmax. The whole, the whole thing. Yeah, the whole thing. Um, okay. <laughs> Interesting. This is a um, very Showmaxy episode, I must say, because we have Tiny's Baby Diary on Showmax. We have Skimmer Dancers on Showmax. This is like if they if they could have sponsored this episode. That's how <laughs> that's how, that's how Showmaxy it is. <laughs> It would have been brilliant. I actually, what I actually watched um, was this week was um, Swirl. Oh, lovely! Yeah, you and you did, you did. There, I had I had proper moments in that because it took me back to back in the day where I used to watch my mom actually swirling her hair, mm. and like that sort of the scene where the where the girl the mom is brushing the girl's hair, and that sound. And the music yeah. that came along with it was so like it it hit me. Yo, I mm. some some parts are super cheesy, but overall, man, um, I, it's, I, I don't know. I'm just happy that South Africans are making good stuff and telling stories that like haven't been told. Um, you so, know, you laugh. Similar to that, like I um, so I've obviously been watching Skimmer Dance, and this feels like the obvious answer. But um, yeah. <laughs> before the, the interview with Kevin, I'd only just seen one episode. And um, and and then I this weekend when it came out, I watched the, the rest of the 12 episodes. And I was so engrossed in it. And I was, um, I don't know, I just sort of felt like kind of like lost in that world. Which is weird because it's a world that we know. But it was also so brilliantly yeah. told that it just also felt like, 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 like someplace new. And the story is yeah. so interesting and, like, it really did keep me guessing until the end. Um, it's, it's, so, it's so funny. I in, Like, the whole show is, like, based around, like, the Kevin's character, Glenn, dies. And, like, what happens to the family after that? So, I, like, I didn't know that before I watched the first episode. So, when I spoke to Kevin, I was like, um, I was so disappointed that you died. And he's like, Kevin, not as disappointed as I was. <laughs> It's so true. It's so true. Uh, um, but yeah, it is. Um, it is is a really good storytelling. Oh, but but yeah. yeah. And also, like, so guys, so I've been watching a lot of stuff lately, and I've been watching a lot of stuff that I love. So we obviously don't have enough time to talk about everything on the show. So join mm. our discourse group because as we're watching it, we're discussing it, we're talking to other people who also so we like over the last week we spoke about in the discourse group the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. We spoke about um Shadow and Bone, we spoke about the flight attendant. So, you know, join in, chat to us, let's hear what you're watching as well, and then, you know, some recommendations for me. Also next week I'm gonna start shouting out members of the Discord group, I think. I think that's cool. So anyway. So that's all from us. You can find me at, at Karen Walby on Instagram, at Karen Walby's with an S on Twitter, and sign up for my newsletter, Wildest Dreams, wildestdreams.substack.com. Don't forget to follow us on YouTube at What's IGN Crushing On. Our, um, our Love Island roundtable is up there now. It was a lot of fun. Chaos, but a lot of fun. And um, also, you can find us on Discord this week. The podcast can be found at, at Crushing On Pod on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at our website, crushingonpodcast.com, and send any feedback to crushingonpod at gmail.com. Join our Facebook group, Crushing On Club, where we chat about the show, celebrity news, recommendations, the whole shebang. Let us know what you think about what was discussed in this week's episode by sending us a voice note or email to crushingonpod at gmail.com. The show is produced by me, Karen, and Rebecca Barches. The show is edited and engineered by Rebecca Barches. Our logo was designed by Latifa Marouf. 
and the show was created in partnership with IGN Africa. If you like the show, tell everyone that you can any way that you can. Keep up to date with all our episodes by subscribing to the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And please rate and review the episodes on Apple Podcasts as it helps others find the show. We'll be back next week with another in-depth conversation with a pop culture lover. See you then.